Good day. Today is Wednesday, the 28th of August, and perhaps when the history of this conflict in Ukraine is written, it will be recognized as one of the most consequential and important days of the entire war. Because it seems to me that the war is now um, accelerating. Um, I was yesterday on Daniel Davis deep dive. Um, Lieutenant Colonel Daniel Davis and I were discussing the situation in the conflict area. And I noticed that Lieutenant Colonel Davis, Colonel Davis, made the point, and bear in mind he's a military officer, that some kind of a tipping point has indeed been reached in the war. I said myself in previous programs that I sensed and felt the same thing. But coming from an officer, a military officer, like Lieutenant Colonel Davis, who's been there, and actually been involved in battle, and has a sense of battle, a sense which I as a civilian perhaps don't have. Anyway, one should treat that comment of his with great weight. Let's look at the situation on the battlefront. And I'm going to start with the situation on the battlefront because it is extremely dramatic. In fact, much of the dramatic, most dramatic news has come since um, Lieutenant Colonel Davis and I spoke to each other. Um, I'm going to try to be as brief as I can. There's an enormous amount of information to digest and cover, but overall the picture is very stark and very dramatic. And I think we it's best to try to discuss it. I'll try and go through things as quickly as I can. Um, over the next, um, you know, for the first part of this program. The first thing to say is that yesterday there were reports that Novogrodivka, the town, formerly of 17,000 people um, at one point, uh, some say that that had fallen to just 14,000 people before the war. But anyway, the reports yesterday circulating both on the Russian and Ukrainian parts of the internet that Novogrodivka had fallen and had passed entirely under Russian control. I don't think this is quite the case myself. Redovka, which is a Russian newspaper based in Smolensk, which I've discussed many times. Anyway, they have reporters on the ground right across the battlefronts. They're very well informed about the situation. And they were saying that the, the Russians are in control of 90% of Novogrodivka. There was still a rear guard, a Ukrainian rear guard in the northern tip of this town, uh, trying to uh, hold the Russians back whilst most of the garrison retreated and taking advantage of the fact that there are two big slag heaps just on either side of the northern tip of Novogrodivka, which act as kind of gates and provide some kind of shield for this rear guard to try to stand the Russian advance. And as I understood the report from Radovka, it's likely that there are also still Ukrainian troops in the western part, some of the western streets, some of the streets in the far west of Novogrodivka, though Radovka appears to expect that they will retreat fairly soon and try to take their positions in a coal mine and slag heap that lies some distance to the east of the town itself. These are obviously all coal mining towns. Anyway, this morning there were reports that the Russians have captured one of the two slag heaps at the very northern end of the town, the two the gateways to uh, Nov Novogrodivka from the north, which makes it likely that the rear guard that had been set up in the northern part of the town has now withdrawn. I don't know what the position is 
with the Ukrainian forces in the western part of the town. But I'm guessing that before long they will have retreated as well. Quite probably, Novogrodivka will fall entirely under Russian control over the course of today. And it may be that that has already happened as of the time of making of this program. And it's entirely plausible that by the time you're watching this program, there will be reports of this and pictures of Russian soldiers raising their flags in different parts of Novogrodivka um, available on the internet. But anyway, that is the situation in Novogrodivka as of, but to my knowledge, as of the time of making of this program. Now, Novogrodivka, town of 17,000 people in the early 2000s, maybe it was rather less um, just before the war began. People like Julian Repke are saying that his population was around 14,000 then. It has been captured by the Russians, almost intact, with minimal damage and limited fighting over the space of just a week. That is unprecedented in this war. That has never happened at any point in this war before. So Novogrodivka, probably just a few hours from falling or coming under Russian control, perhaps as of the time of making this program, it has already done so. Now, that is dramatic news. But elsewhere in the same area where Novogrodivka is located, the area around Pakrovsk and Mirnograd, the news is just as dramatic. Firstly, early this morning, reports were appearing in the, across the internet, coming from both Russian and Ukrainian sources, that the Russians have also entered the town of Selidovo. Selidovo, a smaller place than Novogrodivka, located to the south, population around 10,000. Um, it was, unlike Novogrodivka, an important logistical center, keeping the Ukrainian forces in the south, in places like Kurakovo and Vugleda supplied. Uh, it was a place where the Ukrainians gathered their the equipment and the supplies and then sent it on southwards along the railways and the roads. Well, it looks as if the Russians are now in the process of storming Selidovo as well. And there is immediately to the east of Selidovo, a village called Mikhailovka. There have been many reports at various times that the Russians have captured Mikhailovka. It seems as if they do actually control Mikhailovka. And there is the gigantic slag heap next to Mikhailovka, which apparently towers over Selidovo and all of the surrounding countryside. And there are now reports that the Russians have control of that slag heap as well. The Ukrainians were unable to defend themselves there. Uh, there's been no ability to create a proper organized defense in the Selidovo area, relying on the slag heaps and on the coal mines. And, well, uh, there have been suggestions that because this slag heap is such a dominant feature of the surrounding landscape that control of the slag heap all but guarantees control of the whole of Selidovo passing to the Russians within the space of just a few hours. Well, all that is dramatic already, but events are in the surrounding area, not just in Selidovo itself, are almost equally dramatic in other places as well. First of all, um, yesterday I mentioned that there were film, there was pictures showing Russian troops raising their flags in a village called Kalinovo, which is located immediately to the north of the M04 highway. This is the highway that lies, uh, that, 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 uh, that connects um, an important village called Karlovka, um, which the Ukrainians fell back to after the fall of Pervomaisky 
and Itailovo, close to Avdeevka. They were able to hold the Russians there, taking advantage of various uh, water barriers, res reservoirs and such things. Anyway, there are reports that the highway that was used to send supplies to the Ukrainian forces in Karlovka, supplies from Pakrovsk and Mirnograd that the Russians had crossed and in effect cut that highway and that they had occupied a village called Memrik. Well, we now have pictures of the Russian soldiers in Memrik raising their flag. This is a village to the south of the highway. It is now, I think, unchallengeable, indisputable fact that the Russians are indeed not only present in that village, but also in control of it. And there are reports that the Ukrainian troops in Karlovka have abandoned their positions in Karlovka, that they're afraid of being surrounded in Karlovka, and that they have retreated to the village of Galicinivka, which lies immediately to the west, which was their forward supply base. There are suggestions that Galicinivka itself is undefendable, and that these Ukrainian troops who have retreated from Karlovka to Galicinivka are likely to withdraw from Galicinivka, which will presumably pass under Russian control, and retreat to the next town, Ukrainsk, which is itself, by the way, now an obvious further target for the Russians. Ukrainsk has a population or had a pre-war population of around 10,000. It's another one of these small coal mining towns which of which we see so many in this part of the Donbass. One way or the other, it looks as if the Russians are now in control of the entire highway between Karlovka and their northern positions close to um, Mirnograd. And this is important because this highway ultimately extends um, all the way, if one follows it, to uh, Donetsk city. It means that the Russians are able to move troops and supplies up this highway um, past Selidovo towards uh, um, places like um, uh, uh, past Selidovo, all the way up to um, their positions close to um, Pakrovsk itself, opening up another possible route to advance on Pakrovsk from the south once Selidovo itself is captured. Now, I say this, I don't think anybody has noticed so far the importance of this particular highway, but I'm going to suggest that maybe the Russians are indeed planning to capture Selidovo. Uh, once they've captured Selidovo, are also planning to capture Ukrainsk, because control of this highway does, it seems to me, serve to solve any logistical problems that the Russians might have trying to keep their forces supplied uh, through roundabout routes using smaller highways leading from places like Avdeevka and Ocheretino further to the east. Just saying. Anyway, there we are. So um, events moving very quickly along these southern, these southern lines, these southern positions. Further north, close to Pakrovsk itself, in fact, very close to Pakrovsk itself, Yesterday, we got news that the Russians have entered and are storming a village called Mikhailovka, which is located two kilometers close to Mirnograd itself, and that the village of Grodivka, which lies on the main road from Progress to um, uh, Mirnograd, has also fallen under Russian control with the Ukrainians having abandoned it. We see the collapse of the entire 
Pokrovsk front line, and it is happening at lightning speed. If it's correct that Novogrodivka is going to fall today, it seems overwhelmingly likely. If Selidovo also is captured within the next few days, or some say even hours, if the Russians are able to wrap up and capture Ukrainsk as well, as well as Karlovka, well, as I said, they have a clear road all the way up to um, Pokrovsk itself from the south, a major highway that they can use connecting their advance forces directly with their biggest logistical center, which is the city of Donetsk. And they can use this road to keep their forces supplied. And that will enable them, presumably, to keep their forces supplied as they attack Pokrovsk itself. And also, once they've captured Pokrovsk, which I am confident is indeed a target for the Russians, then of course they have still more highways and railway lines that they can use to advance westwards towards the Dnieper, if that's what they decide to do. Very probably that will be their plan. Now, more events are developing elsewhere. The other big news today, and again we have multiple pictures of Russian soldiers raising their flags um, in the place, is that Konstantinovka, the village that lay on the main road, the main supply line to Vugledar, that um, Konstantinovka has now been captured. Um, we have pictures which show Russian soldiers raising their flag at the absolute westernmost building of this village and by the way I've seen pictures of this village what it looks like now it is an absolute lunar scape it is absolutely devastated the contrast with the situation in um, Novogrodivka which as I said has fallen under Russian control almost intact is stark the Ukrainians the Ukrainian fort army resisted as strongly as it could in Konstantinovka, but it is no longer able to put up that kind of resistance, it seems, any longer. Supplies are collapsing, the supply system is collapsing. One gets the sense that the entire organization of the battlefront is collapsing. There's pictures apparently showing the troops of the 79th Brigade fleeing Konstantinovka, which they have fiercely defended for the last few weeks. The Russians in hot pursuit and Konstantinovka now completely under Russian control. And one wonders whether the Ukrainians, the remnants of the brigade, are going to be able to resist the Russians in any of further positions to the west. But of course, the key point about the capture of Konstantinovka is that it now conclusively severs the supply roads, this, the main supply road to Vugledar. Vugledar has lost its main supply road. The Russians, of course, cut the road some time ago. They've captured various fortified positions along it. They're advancing well to the west of this supply road. They're close, apparently closing in on the village of Odiane in this particular area. Um, also another coal mine in this area as well. Unlikely that that can be defended as well either. And there are reports that the Russians are also now advancing from the south west, that they are undertaking a flanking movement and it looks as if a kind of pincer movement is being created around Vugledar, with the Russians planning to encircle that town and its garrison if the Ukrainians decide to stay there. More likely than not, they will retreat. And that could happen now within the next couple of days or perhaps weeks, 
And of course, if Vugladar falls, if the Russians <laughs> complete their various moves in this area, well, the entire Ukrainian position in southern Donbass is going to collapse. Um, the defense of places like Kurakovo is going to become <laughs> extremely problematic, to put it mildly, and we could be seeing um, a situation where um, the Russians have an open way to attack Pokrovsk itself, and they'll be able to advance not just along the main road and the highway from Pokrovsk to the Dnieper, but they can probably advance from the south towards the Dnieper as well. Something which, as I've said many times, will be an existential moment for Ukraine if it happens. Now, there is growing alarm about these developments in Ukraine itself. And there's been a long article about them, which I have found, which appears in Euromaidan, which is a Ukrainian nationalist, um, anti-Russian, well, obviously anti-Russian, pro-Ukrainian, uh, website. It was already prominent during the Maidan protests of 2013-2014. It obviously takes its name from the protests, which referred to themselves as Euromaidan. Maidan being, of course, the square in central Kiev where the protests were concentrated. These were the protests that eventually led to the fall of the Yanukovych government and its replacement by the current political system, if you like, in Ukraine. Anyway, the, there is a long article by a Ukrainian blogger called Tarigami, Tar, Tatarigami, I'm sorry, um, who uh, regularly comments about the situation on the Ukrainian battlefronts, and often in a very insightful way, and he discusses the situation in Pokrovsk, and though he tries to end on an optimistic spin, giving, giving an optimistic note, suggesting that it might still be possible to defend Pokrovsk, at least for a while, you can sense he's growing alarm. And he says that there is a lack of clarity about why Pokrovsk is different from any other lost settlement. In the Donbass, he then says that we need to go back and look at the situation after the Russians captured Avdevka. And then he continues in this way. Before falling to Russian forces in February 2024, the Avdevka area played a key role for Ukrainian troops for nearly a decade, serving as a fortress that secured vital logistic routes in the Donbass, Donetsk Oblast. It was also seen as a potential foothold for future Ukrainian efforts to deoccupy, in other words, recapture Donetsk. And then the um, Russians, as he says, focused on the recapture of, of on the capture of Avdevka. And he says that the goal of the operation was not merely to capture Avdevka, but to gain access to the operational space behind it. Once Avdevka was secured, it provided the Russians with multiple options and maneuverability. This is a key aspect, because if we examine the theatre solely from a tactical standpoint, focusing on individual tree lines or single settlements, we miss the broader operational objectives of the Russians and the potential consequences for Ukraine if these objectives are achieved. And then he discusses Pokrovsk. He says that with, it, it is situated to the west of Avdevka at a crucial crossroads of multiple railroad lines. It has become a key delivery and railroad distribution hub, facilitating the supply of Ukrainian forces across a broad front line from Vugladar to the north of Donetsk and beyond. Only two places in Donbass serve this function, Pakrovsk and Kramatorsk. Kramatorsk, of course, is at the southern spur 
of the road and supply and railway lines um, passing through Kharkov from the north. And we'll come to those later. The significance of the location and length of the supply line becomes clear when viewed from a map. And then he goes on to say, when us assessing the situation, we should remember that Russia doesn't need to capture Pokrovsk to gain control over the railroad. This is the railroad from Dnieper. Mere proximity to Pokrovsk enables Russian forces to target trains and vehicles with artillery, mortars and drones, effectively re rendering the railway hub unusable. It is highly likely the train operations in the town have already been suspended. And that is undoubtedly true. And it probably also explains the speed of the collapse that we are now seeing in other places like Selidovo, um, Konstantinovka, um, probably Ukrainsk, and of course Novogrodivka as well. The significance of uh, uh, Pakrovsk, however, extends beyond railway connections. This is again Tatarigami. <laughs> The town is also situated at an important road juncture, playing a similar role to the railroads in the transportation and distribution of supplies across the entire front line. The road linking Pakras to Konstantinovka has long been a target of Russian offensive efforts. Cutting off this road would complicate the resupply of troops engaged in the Bakhmut gorlivka area. That's Toretsk and Chasov Yar and Konstantinovka. The potential loss of Pakrovsk poses a serious operational threat to the logistics of the entire region, disrupting supply lines from Vugledar to the south to Gorlivka, in other words, Chasovia in the north. The loss of the, both the road and railway would exacerbate the situation for Ukrainian forces in, the, in Donbass, leading to the loss of potential loss of Kurakovo, Vuglida, and areas both south and north of Toretsk. And then he goes on to say that there's another significant political aspect to this. If Toretsk falls, um, it opens the way for a further advance into Dniepropetrovsk Oblast, which is just 20 kilometers west of Pakrovsk. Given that Russian forces re-entered Kharkiv Oblast from the north in May 2024, there is little reason to believe that Putin, it's always Putin, plans to halt at the administrative borders of the Donetsk and Lugansk Oblasts. If Pakrovsk falls, Russian forces would face minimal ob obstacles in advancing towards Dnieper potentially extending their control into another administrative region of Ukraine, broadening the list of occupied oblasts. And then he says that starting from July, rate of Russian advance has accelerated, allowing them to bypass multiple defence lines that Ukraine hastily constructed after the fall of Avdevka, and then he says that um, 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 the Russian forces are seen uh, have moved beyond several defense positions and with the full control of Novogrodivka, which he assumes, by the way, only one defense line remains beyond, before reaching the outskirts of Pakrovsk. And he then makes this very interesting point. Satellite imagery analysis of seized positions shows evidence of artillery shelling and bombing, though not as extensive in other frontline areas. This likely suggests that Ukrainian troops in the Pakrovs direction were forced to retreat multiple times, lacking sufficient forces and resources to mount an organized defense. While there have been many discussions and concerns about the lack of fortifications behind Avdevka, which are entirely valid, the major issue remains the shortage of available manpower and units to defend these positions. No matter how well constructed or numerous the defences are, if they are only staffed 10 to 20 percent of required capacity, it's under, unsurprising that Russian 
forces are able to overrun them so quickly. And then he talks about the fact that despite everything, it might Ukraine might still be able to pull off some kind of successful defense of Pakrovsk, that he doesn't explain how. And he says that it is absolutely essential that this be done, because if Pakrovsk falls to the Russians quickly, there are no fortified positions to the west of it between Pakrovsk and the town of Pavlograd, which surprisingly he doesn't mention, and the Dnieper itself. <laughs> so this comes from a Ukrainian source. It is very close, by the way, to what the Ukrainian MP Mariana Bezuglaya was saying a few days ago, that Ukraine is losing positions at incredible speed. Fortified lines are being abandoned incredibly fast. It seems as if the whole of Donbass is being lost at lightning speed, despite the intense resistance that Ukraine put up before. And, well, this article um, discusses at length the importance of Kramatorsk as another potential defense position. This is what, uh, sorry, of Kramatorsk, uh, this is what Tatarigami says, but of course the situation in the area of Kramatorsk is also becoming critical as well. Because yesterday there were reports that the Ukrainians have now begun the evacuation of civilians from the city of Konstantinovka, north of Toretsk. That is a sign that the Ukrainians perhaps are now expecting resistance either in Toretsk or in Chasovya, or perhaps in both places, to collapse very soon. And that the battle for Konstantinovka could begin within the next few weeks, in which case, of course, if Konstantinovka, an admittedly large place, also falls under Russian control, well, in that case, Kramatorsk itself finds itself under siege and the entire defense position, the entire supply position and defense position of the Ukrainian forces in uh, Donbass becomes threatened. Now, over the last 24 hours or so, there's been actually less news from the Torevsk and Chasovya areas, but for the record, it seems that the Russians are advancing in both places. There continues to be a significant amount of Ukrainian resistance, apparently, in Chasov Yar, where there are still some um, strong Ukrainian units. But in Toretsk, reports are suggesting that the defences are collapsing and that Toretsk itself might be might be close to falling and that this could take place perhaps sometime next week. Well, there we go. An absolutely, uh, an astonishing situation, a catastrophic situation. Um, the entire defense lines in Donbass collapsing at extraordinary speed. And this, as it, is becoming increasingly clear that the last reckless gamble that the Ukrainians had uh, to play, the gamble to try to capture positions in Kursk Oblast, that appears to be, that appears to have failed. Now, yesterday um, we got news which corroborates information that's been coming from a group of forces north and from the Russian Defense Ministry that the Russians are indeed on the counter, uh, back on the counterattack 
in the Kursk area. I'm not going to discuss today the reports from Group of Forces North and from the Defence Ministry. Um, they are much the same. They are now becoming increasingly less informative as one senses that the Russians move to the offensive. This is a typical pattern by way of illustration um, that we have the Russians now st on the brink of capturing Novogrodivka and storming Selidovo and closing in on Karlovka and <laughs> capturing Konstantinovka, all of these places on the southern and east western front lines in Donbass, the Russian Defense Ministry uh, um, yesterday uh, announced that a village called Orlivka, which was captured by the Russians about a week ago, had been captured. And this morning they said that another village, Kamyshevka, had also been captured, even though we have information about the capture of that particular village from several days ago as well. So when the Russians begin offensives, offensives uh, the defence ministry tightens up the reporting. And this is now something that we're starting to see uh, happening in the Kursk uh, area also. Um, the one thing, by the way, that I would just say is that, again, I noticed that in this very latest report, um, Group of Forces North once again quoted, quoted Lenin two days ago, presumably for some kind of ideological balance, they quoted the anti-communist Russian philosopher Elin. <laughs> anyway, there we go. Uh, they do seem to have a very literary-minded person um, editing their website who clearly wants to preserve balance, or at least the appearance of balance even though one suspects that he is, like lots of people in the Russian military, perhaps still biased a little towards the uh, Bolshevik side of Russian history. Anyway, let's, let's, let's talk about what's going on in Kursk, because yesterday there were uh, multiple reports that there had been more attempts by the Ukrainians to capture Malaya Loknia, but that the Russians have consolidated control of this village, I spoke yesterday about how the Russian news agency TASS said that an important height had been captured in the Suja area, though they didn't provide any actual topographical or geographical details. Uh, there are reports yesterday that the Russians have are now firmly in control of villages like Zhuravli and uh, that they've recaptured the settlement, the workers' settlement of Korenovo, near the village of the same name. This was confirmed by the Russian Defense Ministry that the Russians are in control of a place called Oglov, Oglovka. This is again a place which many are reporting as being under Ukrainian control, but it seems that it is not. The most important news is that the Russians have begun shelling Ukrainian artillery position, sorry, uh, Ukrainian positions in Suja itself. The Russians have begun bombing and shelling Ukrainian positions in Suja. Now that suggests to me that a operation by the Russian army to storm Suja is probably um, being prepared. It might take place sometime next week. Just saying. Suja is the only important settlement that the U Ukrainians have captured in Kursk, uh, in, Kursk re in Kursk region, a town of about 5,000 people before the war. Um, the Ukrainians made various attempts to attack in other directions. Um, again, if you want to see a detailed discussion of this, um, I discussed it with Daniel Davis um, um, yesterday, but I don't think we need to go into huge amount of detail on this channel. 
the, the simple fact is that the Ukrainian offensive captured Suja, a number of villages around it, then got bogged down in the hills and the forests and the streams. There are claims now starting to appear um, in the Russian media that large groups of Ukrainian soldiers, lightly armed Ukrainian soldiers, sent to seize various positions in the rear of the Russian forces, trying to imitate the successful tactics that the Ukrainians used in their Kharkov 2022 offensive, that with the solidifying of the front lines and with the Russians successfully holding the positions, that there are still several of these so-called sabotage and reconnaissance groups that are basically cut off and are hiding in the forests and that the Russians are hunting them down and, there are, and that they're destroying them one by one. In other words, these are reconnaissance groups which have not been sent into the Russian rear over the last two weeks. They are the product of the original offensive that the, Rus that the Ukrainians carried out in the first, in the second week of August, that these groups found themselves cut off. They've been unable to return and re-establish contact with the main Ukrainian forces and that the Russians are now hunting them down in the woods and in the woods and forests. Um, rather a brutal story and it illustrates the limitations of the tactics that the Ukrainians used um, in, both in Kharkov in 2022 and in Kursk this year. They are very successful against light opposition, but when they come up against strong defences and organised forces, they not only fail, but that they doom large numbers of soldiers to, frankly, rather grisly outcomes. Anyway, that's the overall situation. The Russians are pushing back. They're now regaining control of territory. And my own sense is that they're uh, working up towards an attack on Suja itself. There is a school of thought <laughs> which says that it makes better sense for the Russians to keep the Kursk operation going, to allow the Ukrainians to retain a foothold in Kursk, because the Ukrainians are having to deploy more and more forces to maintain their positions there, and that this enables the Russians to continue to conduct massive attrition against the Ukrainians there. There is indeed force behind this argument. General Sirsky, the Ukrainian military chief, has said that Ukraine has deployed 30,000 troops to um, um, Kursk and Sumy regions. Ukrainian logistics in this area are terrible. Ukrainian losses are very high. The Ukrainians continue to lose large numbers, large quantities of armoured vehicles and tanks in this area, though recently I've noticed that the number of tanks that the Ukrainians lose on any particular day has been diminishing, presumably because there are fewer and fewer tanks left to lose, just saying. But um, General Sirsky admitted that the hope or expectation that the Russians would redeploy forces from Donbass to try to hold the Ukrainians back in Kursk has not been realized. Instead, the Russians are pulling forces to the Kursk area from elsewhere within Russia. Well, that is indisputably true. And then, of course, it begs the question then of why the Ukrainians continue the operation in Kursk and why given that the Ukrainians, against all logical sense, insist on conducting, continuing the 
operation in Kursk, why in that case the Russians, instead of allowing them to continue to do so, to do so, given that this is turning to Russia's military and strategic advantage, why instead it seems as if they are preparing instead to take action to push the Ukrainians back. Well, politics explains, I think, here the actions of both parties. From a Ukrainian perspective, a retreat from Kursk would be a massive blow to the prestige and authority of the Zelensky government. It would be an admission of failure. And at this point in the war, I think that the Zelensky government feels that they can't afford it, that if something like that happened, there would be so much criticism of the whole Kursk operation that President Zelensky himself might not be able to survive it politically. As for the Russian side, well, I think here considerations are perhaps more ruthless with the military perhaps playing a bigger role in making the decisions. But there is nonetheless, I suspect, a certain degree of political pressure to end this Kursk affair um, that probably by this point there's a calculation that as much damage has been done on the Ukrainians as is necessary and that the moment has now come for the Russians to um, finish off the incursion in Kursk and perhaps to prepare for their own offensive in Sumy region in turn. So there we go. That may be the calculations on each side. But it's likely, as I said, I think it's likely that we're going to see an attempt by the Russians to recapture Suja, an operation towards Suja next week. Compared to the scale of the fighting in Pakrovsk, the events that are happening in the Pakrovsk area and in Donbass, it's important to stress that this battle remains a sideshow. Though, going back to the article by Tatari Ghani, we see the extent of Zelensky's and Sirsky's folly. Because Tatari Ghani talks about a shortage of Ukrainian troops in the vital Pakrovsk area to hold back the Russians. And, well, Sirsky tells us that there are 30,000 troops in Sumy region and Kursk where they're being steadily attrition by the Russians. How different the situation might have been if those 30,000 troops, instead of being sent on this wild adventure in the forests of Kursk, had instead been relocated to hold the defences around Pakrovsk. I think the Russians would still have broken through, but it would have taken them much longer, and probably we would not be where we are now, where towns like Selidovo, Novogrodivka, perhaps before long Ukrainsk, and eventually Pakrovsk and um, Mirnograd are falling one after the other like nine pins. Just saying. Anyway, there it is. That's the situation in the Kursk area as well. The Russians back on the attack there and perhaps preparing for an attack on Suja, which may be developing at some point over the next week. It's just a guess. I may be wrong. As I've said many times, the Russian general staff doesn't share its plans with me. Now, before I continue and start discussing the politics, which are becoming not only um, astonishing but even bizarre, let me let me let me speak um, about the Russian missile attacks that have taken place 
across Ukraine, the enormous devastation that they have done to the electricity system. Now, every so often one gets an invaluable email from someone explaining the situation and providing an extra understanding of what has happened. And that took place early this morning because I've received an email from someone who is extremely familiar with the technical aspects of these matters of the electricity and energy system. He has technical qualifications in this area of the highest level. He also has hands-on experience because he's very familiar with the situation of what happened when um, electricity substations were destroyed during the NATO bombing of Yugoslavia in 1999. Anyway, this person says that the idea that these electricity substations can be repaired quickly is simply wrong, that repairing these stations is a complex and difficult undertaking, that each substation requires, each station requires um, specific work and handling. And one, it isn't just a case of you know, one size fits all type of repairs. And he made the point to me that he took U Yugoslavia after a NATO air campaign that lasted only something like 90 days from memory, it was much, much less intense than what we have been seeing with the Russian missile strikes in Ukraine. And a NATO air campaign that was not primarily focused on destroying Yugoslavia's electricity and energy system. Anyway, it nonetheless took U Yugoslavia three years to repair it and to bring it back to a pre-war condition. And the damage done to Ukraine's energy system is of a completely different order of magnitude. And the problems of repair are immeasurably greater. This person thinks that it will only be possible to conduct repairs on specific stations, that these particular stations could only be brought back to a condition of full repair with whether well, it might take up to four years. So again, I realize that I have been overly influenced in my understanding of events by things that uh, European officials especially European officials, I remember Ursula von der Leyen talking about this very thing, um, were saying at the, uh, during the period of the Russian missile offensive against the energy system in 2022-2023, they were talking then about how Ukraine needed help to bring this system back into a state of repair. I can remember all kinds of promises to provide spare parts and equipment being made at the time. And I remember reading all sorts of claims that it would be brought back into repair fairly quickly and that the air defense system, the Patriots and the NASAMs and the IRISTs would prevent the Russians from doing the same kind of damage again. Well, I now realize that every single part of those claims all of those claims about the air defences and the repairs, all of that was nonsense. Probably the people who were saying it, the European officials who were saying it, they were primarily Europeans who were saying it, said it in good faith. They believed it. It's just another example of the fact that these people talk about things that they actually know nothing about and that they don't consult and discuss properly with the people on the technical side, the, the genuine experts who could explain to them 
that what they are asking is impossible. Just saying. Anyway, there we go. That's uh, that's something I wanted to correct about the missile attacks on the energy system. I suggested yesterday that perhaps repairs could be done to the damage that has been done, but it looks as if this is simply not realistic in any in any uh, medium or short term time time scale. Um, I would add, by the way, that a couple of weeks ago, months ago, when the Russians resumed their offensive against Ukraine's en energy system, what John Helmer calls the electricity war, the um, there was a lot of commentary and discussion in Ukraine about the fact that nothing had been done to repair the damage that had been done to the energy system over the course of 2022-2023. There were lots of claims about corruption, that there had been corruption which had prevented the repairs being done. And no doubt, given that we're talking about Ukraine, there was quite a lot of corruption. But it seems overall that the problem was not corruption. The problem is that repairs on the scale that would be needed to bring back the energy system to pre-war condition, that this is impossible to do given the war conditions and the time available in which to do the repairs. And that, of course, now brings us to the next point, because President Zelensky, with a situation that is collapsing all around him, with an, a military collapse, his armies in Donbass facing complete military collapse, with reports that there are troops in Torets region who are surrounded and are apparently begging for help from lawyers <laughs> as they uh, apparently are considering disobeying orders from their command, which appear to be irrational, with Pokrovsk and Mirnograd um, now looking undefendable, with the Russians capturing one town after another at lightning speed, <laughs> with the Kursk offensive not only stopped, but starting to reverse with the energy system in Ukraine in ruins, with Ukrainians suffering from blackouts and electricity shortages, with water supplies in Ukraine starting to fail, with Ukraine now being in a state of default, unable to meet its payments um, because there's not been the agreement with the creditors that was reported or claimed to have happened some weeks ago <laughs> with uh, the situation with the $50 billion loan that the G7 states have promised Ukraine, all that stuck. Well, despite all of that, Zelensky says that he has a plan for victory. He apparently believes that if his plan is implemented, then Ukraine can still achieve victory in spite of all of the conditions that we are seeing. And of course, negotiations of the sort that might be needed to bring the war to an end, these he is clearly not interested in. After his meeting with Prime Minister Modi, as I've already discussed, he gave an interview with the Indian media in which he trotted out all the same demands. He demanded again that all the territory be returned, <laughs> that, um, in fact, um, the situation um, should be brought back to what it was in 1991 in territorial terms. Crimea also should be returned to Ukraine. And then, and only then, will the Ukrainians sit down and talk to the Russians. And that will be about completing the terms, essentially, of Russia's surrender. And that was 
a pitch that Ukraine, that Zelensky had sort of walked away from for some months. He'd been telling various interested third parties, keen to help him in Brazil, in China, in India, that actually this time he really was interested in serious negotiations. He wanted a peace conference at which the Russians would be invited. He might be prepared to make concessions, which he had not been prepared to make up to this point. But now all of that apparently has gone. Um, the Kursk offensive changed all of that. Apparently he now understands that the Russians are not interested any longer in negotiating from him. Putin's spokesman, Dmitry Peskov, has repeated that today. He's just said that no preconditions exist for negotiations with Ukraine at the moment. The, the, the situation does not, is not conducive to one way negotiations can start. And the interested third parties who were keen to help Ukraine, China, India, Brazil, all of those, having seen the double game that Zelensky was playing with the Kursk operation, well, apparently they're now all walking away and they're saying good riddance. Anyway, despite all of that, Zelensky insists that he still has his plan for victory. He's not talking about negotiations anymore. He still intends somehow to win the war. Um, he's not provided us with details of this plan, but he has given a fascinating, his own fascinating view about what could happen if the Russians do attack Pokrovsk. He says if the Russians attack Pokrovsk, there will be a gigantic battle there. The Russians could lose up to 60,000 men killed, <laughs> that it will be a disaster for the Russians in terms of losses comparable to the battle of Bakhmut that took place a year ago. Speaking of which, by the way, <laughs> it took about a year before the Ukrainians finally officially admitted, or at least Zelensky admitted, that Bakhmut, Bakhmut had indeed been captured by the Russians. But anyway, he now says that if the Russians try and capture Bakhmut, the battle will be as intense Intense, uh, intense as it was in Bakhmut. Well, perhaps he's right. Perhaps there are Ukrainian troops in Pakrovsk. Perhaps defences are indeed being prepared there. But we see that there is little evidence of that at the moment. The fact that all of these settlements are collapsing at such speed around Pakrovsk. Well, that suggests a different story. And people like Tatari Gani, Ukrainian blogger, they clearly are not convinced by all these hopeful word, words either. And then, of course, Zelensky says that Ukraine has now developed its own ballistic missile. He talked about how Ukraine has already developed its cruise missile. We've had pictures of this cruise missile, which, as I said, looks like a Tomahawk missile. We've had claims that Ukraine has now tested its ballistic missile. Ukraine actually has built ballistic missiles. Once upon a time, not so long ago, Ukraine was at the hub of Russia's, of the Soviet Union's missile and rocket industry. The gigantic Yuzhny plant in what was then the Soviet city of Dnipropetrovsk. It's now, of course, the city of Dnipro, produced many of Russia's the Soviet Union's intercontinental ballistic missiles and played a significant role in the Soviet Union's space program. Uh, even after the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, the factory in Dnipro still continued to produce rockets and from, according to my understanding, it continued to uh, produce Tochka missiles. These were um, systems not entirely different in capability 
and performance and function to the attack of missiles of the United States, produced by the United States of that period. And I understand that production of Tochka missiles continued in Ukraine, well, pretty much up to the point when the war began. <laughs> so it's true that Ukraine does have an indigenous missile capability, but Zelensky says that Ukraine has now completed production of an entirely new, all new ballistic missile. And of course, it's now been um, put into action and presumably production of this missile and of the cruise missile is just round the corner. How this production is going to take place in conditions where there is massive missile barrages by the Russians every day, when there is a shortage of electric power across the country. None of that, of course, is explained by Zelensky. He also says that the F-16s participated in providing the air defense for Ukraine during the recent Russian missile strikes and that they performed excellently. Well, apparently the six of them, just a few pilots. It's not clear that the <laughs> um, armament for these F-16s has yet been supplied. Perhaps they did play a role, but the success of the Russian missile strikes speaks for itself. If the F-16s were used, it doesn't seem as if they made much actual difference. But anyway, let's, let's put all that aside. Let's focus instead on the other part of Zelensky's comments. He says that he has a victory plan, a victory plan that he's going to meet with President Biden in September, and he's going to outline to President Biden what his plan for victory is. And actually, it's not difficult to guess what it is. To get the West to fight and win the war for him, because even he must understand that there is no possibility now, none, that Ukraine can do it by itself. So today, apparently, has been, well, a meeting has been convened of the NATO Ukraine Council. And according to most reports, the Ukrainian representatives at this meeting asked the NATO powers to send their aircraft into Ukraine to shoot down Russian missiles. According to the polls, not a single NATO state was prepared to do that. None of them were prepared to send their aircraft into contested airspace where they might be vulnerable to attack by the Russian air defense system and the Russian air force. So that plan was summarily rejected. But Zelensky, of course, has other plans. He also wants the Western powers to agree to his proposals to launch missiles deep inside Russia itself. And, of course, he's talking about Storm Shadows and Attackums missiles. And here he has allies. He's got allies in the British, in the Poles, and the Baltic states. They all want this escalation as well. Um, so far, it seems, the administration in Washington is holding the line. They are against this plan. Uh, they're saying that it has no military, serves no military purpose, and that the major Russian targets are outside range, beyond the range. And besides, um, if the West starts to involve itself, as it would have to do, in conducting missile strikes against Russia, well, that could result in a dangerous and unparalleled escalation. And I understand that Russian officials have been making pointed, giving, giving pointed warnings, 
both on and off the record, that strong action will be taken by Russia if such a thing is done. Um, the Russian foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, has now spoken, and he said that the Russians are now in the process of revisiting the question of nuclear thresholds, whether, which is code for saying that they might be preparing to lower the threshold for first use in nuclear weapons, and that this is a potential reaction to what has just happened in the Kursk area and in other places. And um, the Russian deputy foreign minister, Sergei Ryabkov, has also been giving, giving very strong public warnings um, about possible Russian reactions if long-range missiles are indeed used against Russia. <laughs> and, well, it seems as if these warnings are being noted, though undoubtedly a debate is happening in the United States over whether or not to take these warnings seriously and to comply with them, or whether instead the West should just continue to do what it has consistently done up to this point, which is to capitulate to every one of Zelensky's demands and to give him whatever weapon systems he wants um, so that he can continue to prosecute the war. Now, yesterday, I read an article in the Financial Times by the very well-connected journalist there, um, Gideon Rackman, and it discussed how the operation in Kursk that the Ukrainians have carried out not only breaches Russian red lines, that is not strictly true, as I've discussed before, but it breaches American red lines as well, that the Americans have previously said that they did not want their weapon systems to be used on Russian territory. And here we are, and Abrams tanks and strikers and Bradleys are all operating in on Russian territory, what the United States recognizes as Russian territory, which is Kursk region. The article by Gideon Rackman contains this I found most remarkable paragraph. According to a recent book by David Sanger, Biden, that's to say President Biden, suggested to his aides that Zelensky might be deliberately trying to draw America into a third world war. That's in an article in the Financial Times. And it's apparently set out in a book by David Sanger, which I admit I have not read. Gideon Rackman is a very well-connected journalist. And if he says something like this, I suspect that he believes it to be so. I don't think he's somebody who would write a comment like that if he didn't believe that this was something that Biden had not actually said to his aides. So, the United States, the President of the United States, had been continuing to arm and provide support to the leader of a government, Zelensky, who the President of the United States himself thinks might be deliberately trying to draw America into a third world war. Surely this is someone to put the greatest possible distance to. <laughs> Far from embracing Zelensky, which is what the Western powers have repeatedly been doing, we had that extraordinary episode just a few weeks ago when Zelensky was in London following the recent British election and was invited by the new British Prime Minister Keir Starmer to attend a meeting of the British cabinet in London. <laughs> well, 
This is a person who apparently the president of the United States thinks might be deliberately trying to draw the United States and by extension the rest of the West into World War Three, and he's being invited to attend meetings of the British cabinet. Now, I, I just do not understand the sense of this. Um, Gideon Rackman says that Ukraine is fighting for its survival. It would accept direct US involvement in a war with Russia. It's not just accepting direct in US involvement in a war with Russia. It is, as Gideon Rackman himself says, trying deliberately to draw the United States into a war with Russia, the world's biggest nuclear superpower. Well, we will see what President Zelensky does when he does meet Biden in September. We'll see what Kamala Harris, who will also be attending these meetings, has to say. I hope this time that sanity does indeed prevail, because um, whatever one, one may think of Zelensky, the fact is that his behaviour is not only becoming increasingly reckless and dangerous, but it is becoming delusional as well, which must cast even further doubt on his decisions. He has just, by the way, even as I've been making this program, announced that he's setting up um, military um, administrations in two towns in Zaporozhye region, which have been under Russian control for a very long time now. So he's making arrangements to set up the administration, Ukrainian military administrations in these places, even though, for the moment at least, <laughs> it's the Russians who control them, even as the defence lines in Pokrovsk and elsewhere in Donbass are collapsing. Maybe Zelensky does have some other plan. I mean, there's been some rumours that the Ukrainians are thinking of some kind of offensive in Zaporozhye region. If so, they would be up against a Russian army of 130,000 men, commanded by one of Russia's top generals, General Teplinsky. And of course, the Surovikin line is still there, and it's plausible that the Russians have recreated the minefields that caused the Ukrainians so much, so many problems. But perhaps this is going to be Zelensky's next throw. Or perhaps, as some others believe, he's planning some kind of advance into Belarus. <laughs> he's been, there was a warning given by the Ukrainians some days ago to Belarus, demanding that Belarus must withdraw its forces from the border. Um, perhaps that's a warning, an ultimatum in effect, with the Ukrainians planning some advance into Belarus. Or perhaps Zelensky's other plan is to march into Moldova. Well, here, of course, the Russian army does not have a significant presence. What they would achieve in Moldova, other than open up another front for themselves, it's difficult to see. But at least Moldova, there is not going to be the same kind of resistance but from the Russians, because they say the Russian army isn't there. But it would still require a diversion of some forces from the battlefronts, which are already desperately short of men. One way or the other, however, it's difficult to see that rational decision-making is taking place in Kiev any longer. One senses a regime in its death throes, which is coming up with ever more bizarre rhetoric and plans as it senses 
that its time is almost up. Now, there have been many reports that the US has at various times considered removing Zelensky and replacing him with someone else. My own sense is that the time for that has probably by now passed. Maybe it will be the last throw that the Americans try. But I don't see what that can do. The only thing that can retrieve this situation now, it seems to me, is something completely different. And that is for the United States itself to contact Moscow, to offer to enter into negotiations with the Russians about the security system in Europe and to accept and give an unequivocal undertaking that Ukraine's membership of NATO is off the table. That might induce the Russians to start negotiations. But I cannot imagine that it would be anything less. And I have difficulty believing, if I have to say it truthfully, that even that by this stage of, this, of the war would do. Anyway, a momentous day. I've just seen reports coming up as well, bubbles, that the Julian Repke, the German journalist, is now saying that the Russians have reached the center of Selidovo. He says, by the way, that the population of Selidovo before the war was 23,000, which would make it bigger than Novogrodivka. I'm not sure that is correct. Anyway, I'm, I'm not going to dwell on this. But anyway, the collapse in the Pakrovsk area continues. And in the meantime, Zelensky retreats into harebrained plans and illusions. This is where I finish my program today. More from me soon. Uh, let me remind you again, you can find all our programs on our various platforms, Locals, Rumble and X. Don't forget to support our work via Patreon and subscribe star. Links under this video. And if you've liked this video, tick the like button, please. And check your subscription to this channel. That's me for today. More from me soon. Have a very good day.